please to Exodus chapter 3. And if you can't find Exodus, it's the second book of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 3. We're doing this series on Old Testament characters, and we've entitled it Lives Lived. And we're trying each time to take one Old Testament character and find one feature in their life that we can apply to our own lives as we live in the 21st century. So, let's pray. Father, it is an unspeakable privilege for us to be able to look into the Bible, to be able to read it in English. Many of us have many copies in various English translations, and that's not always been the case through history. Many people only had fragments of the Bible, or they had a piece of the Bible, but they were unable to read. We have literacy, we have copies available to us, and yet sometimes we lack biblical understanding because we don't read, we don't study as we should. Would you please give us that motivation this morning as we look into your word? Because ultimately we want to understand your son, in whose name we pray, amen. Think with me for a few moments about the human brain. We all have one. And here's the thing. We've got a physical brain, and then we've got a non-tangible mind. Isn't it amazing the way that we've been put together? The human brain is maybe the most awesomely complex, ultimately impenetrable field of human study. There's no computer in the world that can match the power of your brain. If we were to grab a 12-year-old kid and try and explain to them what self-consciousness is, right, because we've got our brain, we've got our mind, and part of our mind is a sense of self-consciousness, how would you define that? Remember, you're defining it to a 12-year-old kid. Now, Bethel 12-year-old kids are brighter than most 12-year-old kids, but still, to get it down to a 12-year-old's level, how would you explain what self-consciousness is? You might say it's being aware of yourself. Right? Self-consciousness probably begins with knowing that you exist, being conscious of reality, being conscious of others around me. That's what self-consciousness is. But the Bible says that in addition to self-consciousness, every person has a God consciousness. That somehow, deep in our souls, is this understanding that God exists. Now, we live in an era where lots of people will say, I don't believe in God, and many people are quite dismissive of God. But why is it that anthropologists say that in every, every, every culture ever studied, people have objects or persons of worship. Who do we worship in our culture? Celebrities? Actors? Athletes? Why do people have such a desire to know this person is an actor? I need to know what they think. This person can score 50 goals. I need to know what they value. Why does it matter? And yet that's part of our cultural predisposition. Solomon said that God, and Solomon may have been the brightest person, the most wise person who ever lived, aside from Jesus of Nazareth, Solomon said God has put eternity in the hearts of men. The apostle Paul went further. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said that when people look at creation around them, every person knows something about God. In fact, he goes further. He says every person understands that God has eternal power and divine nature simply by looking at what's been made. I scratch my head. I, I, think, I don't think most people understand that today. Maybe we're not as bright as they were back in Paul's day. But the point he's making is that by looking around, every person understands God exists. And yet here's the thing. We can only understand God in the ways and to the extent 
that he has chosen to reveal himself. And that brings us to Exodus chapter 3. And Moses, if we were to do a survey among Jewish people, right, because the Old Testament is the Jewish Tanakh, it's the Jewish Bible, and if we were to do a survey asking them who the three most important people were in the Bible, who would they say? They would say Abraham, and Gord took us to the story of Abraham in Genesis 22 a few weeks ago. They would say King David, because David was the king during their golden era, and Ken took us to the life of David. And the third person they would say is Moses, because Moses was the, the mediator between God and Israel for the law. And we're going to look at Moses this morning, because here in Exodus chapter 3, the Lord called Moses and instructed Moses about his role that Israel had been in slavery in Egypt, and Moses was the man that God had handpicked to go back to Egypt and to bring the people out. And we're going to focus our discussion this morning around two questions. Number one, in verse 11, Moses asks, Who am I? And then in verse 14, he talks to God and says, Who are you? And Exodus 3 is important for us because it's an epic example of God's self-revelation. God revealing to Moses and thereby through to the people of Israel who he is. He clarified in Moses' mind Moses' own self-understanding. Because when Moses saw who God was, he understood who he was. And so his own consciousness, his own self-awareness was heightened by understanding who God was. And throughout his life, Moses is an example that the more he knew about God, the better he understood himself. So that brings us to chapter 3 of Exodus, the very first verse. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Verse 1 says this. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, let's set our context. Because Moses existed over 14 centuries before Christ. So this is a long time ago. Moses is a man whose life can be evenly divided in 40-year periods. Right? He died at the age of 120. The first 40 years of his life, if you've read through the book of Exodus as part of your year-long Bible reading, you'll know that Moses was a prince in Egypt. Through a weird set of circumstances, this Hebrew boy became a prince, uh, a grandson to Pharaoh. And so for the first 40 years of his life, he lived in luxury in probably the highest culture in the world at that time. The next 40 years posed this great contrast in his life because through his involvement in the death of another person, he fled Egypt. He lives in Midian, where we find him now. He is now a sheep herder. He's a shepherd. He's looking after the sheep that belong to his father-in-law. Can you imagine going from that place of great esteem to this place where he's just nobody? And he spent 40 years doing that. In Midian, the Midianite people were nomadic people. They moved all over the place. And right now, they're living in the Sinai Peninsula. And he's at Mount Horeb, which is also identified later as Mount Sinai. And if you've read through the Bible, you'll know that Moses and the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, and there the whole nation encounters God. Verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He... Moses, looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. This is the mo most unique plant, right? Because here it is, burning, without fuel, the tree is not consumed, there's no damage, and yet the fire continues. And then verse 4 tells us that in addition to all of that uniqueness, this bush contained the voice of God. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, 
God called to him from the bush. Now think with me for a moment about something that's a little bit puzzling that we've already read. There's lots that's puzzling, right? A speaking bush is pretty puzzling. A bush that's on fire and is not consumed is pretty strange. But here's what I want to point your attention to. In the Bible, the Bible makes no excuse. It just assumes that we understand that there are non-physical spiritual beings. The Bible calls them angels, and angels are messengers for God. But approximately 50 times in the Old Testament, the text refers to the angel of the Lord. Now, lots of times it just says angels, but 50 times it says the angel of the Lord, and in many ways, the angel of the Lord is distinguished from God, like in verse 2, right? Because verse 2 tells us the angel appeared to him in a flame of fire. But here in verse 4, the angel is identified with God. God called to him out of the bush. This is what theologians call a theophany. And you can see the word theos, which is the Greek word for God, at the beginning of that word. A theophany is a temporary, visible, audible, physical manifestation of God. Right? God is invisible, he's a spirit, but there are times when he takes on some sort of a physical presence to express himself, and this is one of those times. And verse 4 continues, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Why did God repeat Moses' name? When Moses' attention is drawn to this burning bush, he heard the first time God said his name. My dad's very hard of hearing, and so we often repeat things so that my dad catches it. That wasn't the purpose here. Moses is fixated on this bush. He hears his name the first time, and yet the Lord repeats it. Why does that happen? Well, about 15 times throughout the Bible, names are repeated, and they're never for the sake of somebody not hearing it the first time. Do you ever do that with your kids? You call them three or four times? Selective hearing? I know that doesn't happen in your family, Stephen. It happened a little bit in mine. But that's not what's going on here. Those 15 times where names are repeated indicate something more, something deep. Intimacy, tenderness, pathos. Remember when Gord taught us from Genesis 22, Abraham is about to kill his son, and the angel of the Lord interrupts and says, Abraham, Abraham, you can be sure that from the very first syllable of his first time his name was spoken, that Abraham stopped and froze in place. Why was his name echoed? Intimacy, tenderness, pathos. The young Samuel was living with Eli. Samuel was just a kid. And the Lord called to him at night in a dream, Samuel, Samuel. Again, tenderness pathos, intimacy. Remember when David lost his son Absalom, the son who had tried to bring the nation militarily against his own father? And yet when the boy died, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, Absalom, his name was repeated because of the tenderness and intimacy that David regarded his son. Remember Saul on the road to Damascus? And the bright light knocks everybody down, and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, what about on the cross, where the Lord Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Hebrew categories of antiquity, to repeat a name showed tenderness, showed deep intimacy. And so here... Moses heard his name from the lips of God. Verse 5. Then he said, this is the Lord speaking, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now why was that holy ground? The same reason that Mount Sinai would later be holy ground, or that Mount Zion 
is referred to or thought of by the Hebrew people as being a holy place. Or why the holy land or the holy city are talked about as being holy. It's not because the composition of the soil or the rock strata or somehow the geological composition is any way different from any place around them. It's because this piece of land is set apart by God for his use. Now let's think about the word holy. We've talked about it before. If we were to go up into our Sunday school and do a survey of the kids, they would tell us that holy means to be pure, that to be holy is to be righteous, that to be holy is to observe the law of God. But that's really the second meaning in the scriptures, at least in terms of its frequency of usage. Because more frequently, holy means something that is set apart for God's purpose. Something that is separated, that is distinct, that is different, that is other. And so, when the Lord said to Moses, this is holy ground, the Lord had set that ground apart, that land, that piece of geography, around the tree, around the burning bush, for his purposes. And Moses was to understand that God is there, and that makes it holy. Verse 6, And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So here, God is revealing himself, He's identifying himself with the patriarchs, and Moses knew who he was dealing with. And he is terrified. Remember when we talked about Isaiah in this series? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And what was Isaiah's response? Isaiah didn't say, whoa, this is the greatest day of my life. What do I tell people? He was horrified. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. Verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Now, this is a characteristic of the God of the Bible. Moses is learning about him, and God is responding to suffering and injustice and oppression. Verse 8, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. If you've been reading through your Bible, you'll know that the people of Israel had come down at the time of Jacob because Joseph, his son, had achieved a prominent place in the government of Egypt, and at a time of famine, he welcomed his family down into Egypt to provide for them. This is now 430 years later. Things have changed significantly. The people of Israel are not now a protected people group. They are now slaves, and they've been slaves for generations. Verse 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the people of Israel, out of Egypt. And here's the first of the two questions. Who am I? Verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? This suggests this deep existential question of identity. Who am I? And for the next 40 years, from now till the end of his life, remember this is the last 40-year period. We're just at the end of the second 40-year period of Moses' life. He's now launching into the final 40-year period where he is leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and on towards the promised land. As he does this, he understands God better and at the same time understands himself. But he only understands himself in relation to how he understands God. 
Moses saw himself as belonging to God, as under God's direction. And who God is, therefore defines who Moses is. Verse 12. He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So the first question was, in verse 12, who am I? But here in verse 14, Moses is asking, in verse 13 really, Moses is asking, who are you? And Moses didn't see this answer coming. Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. I am who I am? Does that ever sound strange to our Western 21st century ears? Who would call themselves I am who I am, or I am that I am. And that little phrase became God's personal name. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew people referred to Elohim, which is translated in our Bibles as God. But the term that was his personal name was the word Yahweh, or in the Greek form, it's Jehovah. And Yahweh in Hebrew is fairly similar to what he says here, I am who I am. So what was God conveying to Moses? Remember, this is a time, this is an epic self-revelation where God is revealing who he is to Moses. And remember that principle throughout the Bible and throughout history. We can only understand God to the extent he chooses to reveal himself and in the way he chooses to reveal himself. So, he's chosen to reveal himself to Moses through this strange experience of the burning bush, speaking out of the bush, and now he's telling Moses about himself. So what's he saying? What would Moses understand from this strange name, I am who I am? Well, Moses would understand the same thing that we would. That in some way, God is outside of time. He's timeless. Moses would understand, and the people of Israel came to understand, that in some way God is so different from us because he is ever-present. And he is unchanging. When we see little children and we've not seen them for a few months, think of those of you who have grandchildren, if you haven't seen your grandchildren and they're little for a few months, when you do see them again, you're shocked by how they've changed. When we run into people that we haven't seen for many years, I bumped into somebody I used to work with 11 years ago. Don't think I've seen her in 11 years. She's changed. She probably thought that about me too. But that's the human condition, right? Over time, we change. We know that we change in appearance. We get older and wrinklier and maybe heavier and grayer. But we know that even biologically, our whole bodies change, right? Every cell replaces itself. Our bodies are constantly changing. But the Hebrew people understand that when it comes to God, he is unchanging. He is immutable. God was different from Moses and from every other being, and Moses understood it that day. Okay, you ready to think a little bit deeper? Take a deep breath. What God was conveying to Moses as well, in this name, I am who I am, is the concept of what theologians call God's aseity, a S-E-I-T-Y, like it says on the board. Now, let's think deeply about God's aseity. That's an attribute of God, his self-existence. 
God is completely, totally, profoundly autonomous. Okay? He therefore possesses absolute and ultimate independence. And so he's different from every other being and very profoundly different from you and me because he is without beginning, he is uncreated, he is self-existent, he is uncaused. He holds the power of being in his invisible hand. I think that's what Paul was talking about when he says in Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Now think about this. You and me and every other life form is derived, contingent, dependent, but think about this. Logic demands that if anything exists, then something always existed. Let me say it again. If anything exists, something must have always existed. Otherwise, we are in this viciously, impossibly viciously, infinite regression of cause and effect cause and effect. Something, the ancient Greeks said, must have been the uncaused cause. Something must have been the first mover. Thomas Aquinas was a theologian from the 13th century, and Thomas said, God, therefore, thinking along those lines, God, therefore, is the necessary being. And then he went on to say, God is the being that cannot not be. Do you get that? God is the being that cannot not be. He's the necessary being because something had to kick it all off. If anything exists, something, someone must have the power of being within himself, and God is that ultimate transcendent being. Moses understood that. That's what Paul was teaching in Romans 1. That's what Thomas was articulating in the 13th century. Verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. So Moses walks in to Egypt, and these people, the Hebrew people, who had largely forgotten about God, are now going to learn about God. And everything that transpired in the following weeks, as they saw the plagues, as they left on that first Passover, as they went on to Mount Sinai and saw that display of shock and awe when God gave them the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, was to teach them who God is. He is I am. Verse 15. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Now notice this. This is my name forever. What's his name forever? I am. I am that I am is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now let me end off with one takeaway. What has this got to do with us living all these centuries later? Here is what it's got to do with us. Do you ever hear somebody say, Jesus of Nazareth never claimed to be God? There's nowhere in the Gospels where you can go and see the words out of Jesus' lips where he says, I am God. So clearly he didn't think he was God. No, that's not right. That's so silly. In a Greco-Roman culture where there were hundreds of mythological gods, to say I am God would have evoked a yawn. Oh yeah, one more. But what Jesus did was he identified himself with who the Jewish people knew God to be. How did he do that? 
Well, he received worship. He forgave sin. He used the Son of Man title from Daniel chapter 7. And the real clear evidence that Jesus was claiming to be the God of the Old Testament was that he insisted on using the I am title. Now think about that. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the vine. Now you might say, well, that's no big deal. We use that kind of language all the time. I am standing in the building of Bethel Gospel Chapel. I am warm. I am a Canadian, right? We talk that way all the time. But there's a big difference, and here's how it, how it works. The Hebrew Old Testament was written in Hebrew. That's not a surprise, right? But about 200 years before the time of Christ, many Jewish people decided that the Hebrew Old Testament needed to be translated into the Greek language, because the Greek language was the lingua franca of the empire, of the Greco-Roman world. Everybody spoke Greek. So they began the process of translating the Old Testament into Greek. Now, the New Testament ended up being written in Greek too, but this is 200 years before the time of Christ. When they, these translators, and there were 70 of them, that's why the Roman numeral 70, LXX, is a symbol for the book that they produced, which was the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint. You with me so far? So these Hebrew scholars are translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and when they get to Exodus 3, they're scratching their heads. How are we going to translate, I am who I am? In the Greek language, there are two verbs, two prominent verbs for to be. One is the word ego, from which we get our English word ego, and the, word, the other is the, the Greek word amy. And so what the translators decided to do as they're moving from Hebrew into Greek for I am who I am is they put the two words together. Ego emi. I am, I am. Let's go ahead to the New Testament. The Lord Jesus is speaking. He's recorded in Greek. And what does he say? When he says, I am the door or I am the light of the world or I am the way and the truth and the life, in the original text, and you can look it up in a, in a Bible um, that will, will translate into Greek for you, lots of, Bible, lots of Bible apps will do that. He says, ego emi, I am, I am the good shepherd. I am, I am the vine. He wasn't stuttering. He was using the language that every Jewish person understood. Every Jewish person who understood Greek, and most of them did, they had to speak in Greek for business purposes, understood that the God of Exodus 3 was Ego Emi. That was his name. The Lord Jesus didn't just say that in the seven that I've just recited. He said that in the Gospels about 30 more times. Remember when he was walking on the water? Pat was reading that section in her Bible this morning. Actually, she was listening to it, and I heard it being played. He's walking on the water. The disciples are in the boat. They're terrified to see somebody on the water. And in our English Bibles, it says, don't be afraid, it is I. But in the Greek, it says, don't be afraid, ego emi. I am, I am. What do you think his disciples thought? He's claiming to be God. He's using the name of God from the Old Testament and here he is using this great declaration to make us understand that the God of Exodus 3 is the God of the Gospels. Jesus is God. And he was emphatic in his declaration. That's why his Jewish opponents tried to stone him. He said to his Jewish adversaries, for which of the miracles are you trying to stone me? Not for these, but because you, a mere man, claim 
to be God. Make no mistake. If you're a follower of Christ, you need to understand that Jesus is God. If you're considering the claims of Christ, make no mistake, Jesus claimed to be God. The gospel is all about sinners being saved from the wrath of God by the Son of God, and the cross of Christ, as Ken said, is central to the gospel of God. The gospel, the salvation, the life-transforming gospel of Christ is available to any person, but you can never, ever earn it. It's available to you through belief, through trust, through faith. And you can't know yourself until you first know the God who made you. That's the point that I want to express from this story of Moses. And the whole concept of the I am principle demonstrates to us that you cannot love the Lord Jesus with your heart until you accurately, authentically, and biblically understand who he is with your head. You have to know with your head to love him with your heart. Let's pray. Father, as we continue in this series of these Old Testament characters, these ancient people from millennia ago, there's much that we can learn if our eyes are open. But we can never learn and apply to our lives unless your Holy Spirit penetrates our minds and our hearts. So may we study accurately, may we understand eternal truth, and may we recognize that the most important relationship we can ever have is the relationship with you, Father, through the Lord Jesus, your Son. And that's why, as we've been reminded today, the cross of Christ is central not only to our church and our lives, but also to all of human history. Thank you for this one who died for us. As we pray in his name, amen. Thanks for being with us this morning at Bethel.